Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. This is Lighthouse Radio. It's just after 6 o'clock South African time. This is what does the Bible say. And tonight we are going to be looking at prosperity. Specifically, what is true prosperity? And what is prosperity not? Um, and I know this subject is quite broad. Uh, especially, uh, you know, tithing, the matter of tithing, the matter of giving is closely linked as well to prosperity. But on this program tonight, we are not going to be dealing specifically with tithing or giving. Uh, that is certainly a subject matter that we will be discussing on this program. So, as I said, tonight we will be talking about true prosperity which is really about dwelling in God. My name is Prophet Rian. May you be blessed. May the Lord keep you. May His countenance shine upon you. Uh, after, after I just give you a bit of a background, a bit of a teaching on this, uh, I will also be playing two audio clips for you. One by Paul Washer about the true prosperity gospel and the other one uh, from John Piper who is talking on the dangers of the prosperity gospel. Now, let us understand that the prosperity message is not merely one of earthly money and wealth, but of understanding the greater importance of walking a prosperous life and success in body, soul and spirit. Now, for those who seek the Lord's will shall surely prosper in terms of life, and such life translates into joy, peace, spiritual fortitude, and physical health. It is of far greater concern for God that we walk in His Spirit, be guided by His wisdom, and that our character is renewed by His indwelling, than to merely bless us with riches that we squander. What does indeed, indeed prosper or benefit us if the Lord blesses us with earthly wealth, Yet we are still enslaved by the self, by the world and by the devil, therefore spiritually corrupt and impoverished. Can we truly say we are prosperous if we are wealthy but do not even know the Lord's voice, His Spirit or His truth? This is not prosperity but indeed poverty. Just as prosperity is in essence not about earthly goods, neither is poverty. True poverty is to be estranged from the Lord and to walk in death in its many forms. Now true prosperity is to rise above the poverty of the anguish and fear of the spirit and soul by embracing the life of the Lord. The pride, the arrogance and rebellion of this world lead to the impoverishment of spirit and soul. Yet we are prosperous in the Lord's strength when we truly submit to Him in humility. In Isaiah 61, which was a prophecy fulfilled by Jesus, we learn that the Son of God came to preach the good news to the poor and the meek. This is also the basis of the Great Commission to be fulfilled by all believers. The poor and meek does not merely imply to those who are poor in terms of earthly goods, but those who are spiritually impoverished, who are downtrodden and oppressed in the soul, and who are afflicted by the woes of this world, and who walk not in the life, the love and the liberty of Jesus. True poverty is far greater than being without earthly wealth. It is about a life filled with fear, anxiety, uncertainty, damnation, oppression and enslavement that translates into death in spirit, soul and body. This is therefore the true intent of the spirit of poverty as driven by the devil to bankrupt someone so that they know not the joy, the love, the life and the light of the Lord Jesus. True prosperity is therefore to walk not in such poverty, but to know the fullness of God, to know liberty, to know truth, and to be set free from death and enslavement. That is true prosperity. That is the true gospel of prosperity. We so often forget to preach true enrichment of the spirit, soul and body, which 
comes by embracing the life of Christ. That is what the true gospel is. The true gospel of prosperity. To embrace the life of Jesus, who is the resurrection and life. We defeat poverty when we embrace the prosperity of a life submitted to the will and the way and the life of Jesus. There is no greater wealth than to be set free by the blood of Jesus, to be saved, to be redeemed, and to be delivered. Money, after all, cannot buy our spiritual freedom, and neither can it set us free from the bondages of the world or the devil. Only the liberating life in the blood resurrects us from the pits of our fallen ways to be set on the rock of Jesus. This is true prosperity. And so again, true poverty is when we remain stuck in the pit of our own despair, fallen ways, the spiritual apostasy. The Lord prospered David according to Psalm 40, when he rescued David from a horrible pit to set his feet on sure ground. Now let us understand that the danger of the prosperity doctrine is that it draws us away from Christ to focus only on the self and our own needs. We need to realize the following important truth. The Lord has always and has already provided. It is done. Let me explain. For this does not mean God will not continually provide. After all, it says in Matthew 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. In the days of Abraham, God provided for the lamb at the time when he nearly offered Isaac on the altar. This, of course, was a prophetic action of the day when Jesus would be offered up on the cross, there for a wooden altar. Genesis 28 verse 8 says, Abraham said the following, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Indeed, he has provided, and it is already fulfilled. Prosperity is when we gain Christ in our lives. Yes, we serve the Lord as we know Him as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. But we need to understand God has already provided. He provided for the Lamb in the days of Abraham. As we fast forward, He then provided Jesus to die for our sins. Our provision is in Christ, who is our provision. True prosperity, which is nothing more than a provision for spirit, soul, and body, is found in Christ, and not in the tangible and the earthly. So it needs to be stressed that provision has already come in the form of the Lamb, who was slain before the foundation of the world. This is important to understand, because all that we need is already in Christ. It is fulfilled. This therefore means if we continue to follow Jesus, abide in Him and seek Him, obey Him and trust Him and worship Him, then we walk in provision, therefore prosperity. It is the same concept with the law. If we follow Jesus, then you walk in provision. And if you walk in Jesus, you walk in the law. The problem is that we pray for provision, yet the provision has already been provided for. The problem is not the provision, the problem is following the one who was provided and who is now our provision. You see, a lot of people, they will interpret Matthew 7 as pertaining to physical wants and needs. For believers these days have been rewired to think more of the self and are temporary instead of the kingdom of the eternal, of the divine and of the supernatural. We are after all called to be Christ-centered and Christ-conscious above all else. This is the work of the infilling Spirit of the Lord. Matthew 7 really deals with seeking and finding God. For as we cry out to Him and knock on the door, He shall open, according to Revelation 3 verse 20. And once we find and healed and abide in Him, we discover He is our true provider, just as He is our true healer, comforter and source of redemption and strength. Prosperity teaching as we know it today 
that relies, for example, on Matthew 7, leads us to detach provision from God. For prosperity teaching allows for room and scope for apparent provision from God without really abiding in Jesus or even following Jesus or obeying Him. Prosperity teaching has detached the believer from the divine and the kingdom to focus on the temporary flesh and desires. Therefore, allowing for room to discard God's truth and God's ways. We are, however, called to deny the self, carry the cross, and follow Him, Jesus our provision and provider. For then we shall prosper in spirit, soul, and body. For this it is written in 3 John chapter 2. I read, sorry, 3 John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, and be it in health, just as your soul prospers. We read in Colossians 2, this is what Paul writes, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Lashodicia, for as many as I as have not seen my face in the flesh, Verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of all the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So take note of what Paul writes in verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Matthew 13, the Lord teaches in depth through parables about the kingdom of heaven, which should be our highest treasure and worth. We read, for example, in verse 44 in this chapter, the kingdom of, of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man found it, and he concealed it. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In Jesus we find all our provision, all our strength, our wisdom, our riches and understanding. In him we find our hope, our joy, our peace, our salvation and restoration. You know in Matthew 6 the Lord teaches about the Lord's prayer and not having to worry about that today. Healer reminds us that we must first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the rest shall be added unto us. Now again the Lord spoke such a truth following his teaching on praying which focuses primarily on attention on God, on his will and on his kingdom. And in the Lord's prayer we are told to ask for our daily bread. And remember also Jesus is the bread of heaven, John 6. So our focus, our attention should be on Jesus Primarily, first and foremost, seek his will, then the rest shall be added. That is true prosperity. That is true wealth. Remember, all that but what we see in the tangible first needs to be manifested in the spiritual. So your true prosperity first has to be manifested in the supernatural, to be manifested in the natural. But again, your true prosperity is your life, your peace. Your, 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 your liberty in Christ, in the spirit of the living God. So therefore, if we seek Christ, therefore His kingdom, and we seek His will and way according to the Lord's prayer, then we shall abide in Him who is the bread of heaven and the bread of life. He is our provider and in, and in Him is our provision. Not just physical provision, but provision of spiritual and emotional want and need. He is our provision that has already been provided for, so we must pray to abide more in Him, according to John 15. For then we shall bear much fruit. Therefore, prosperity in spirit and soul that strengthens the flesh. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says the following, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Again, to prosper means being well, healthy and alive in spirit, soul and body. You see, we can only prosper when the blood of life, when the blood of life covers our sins, for it brings us under the covenant of grace and life. But there is no prosperity without the blood of Jesus, therefore no life. So once again, Proverbs 28 takes us back to Jesus, to the blood, to his sacrifice and to the kingdom. 
Prosperity has got nothing to do with the tangible and the earthly, or about such wealth or needs, but it is about our relationship with Jesus. You see, what does it benefit us to be wealthy, yet we have no peace, no certainty and no calmness in times of the storm? What does it benefit us to be materially prosperous, yet we are entrapped by our sins and by our fleshly desires? Is it of any worth to remain bankrupt of faith and trust, yet we cry out for God's earthly riches? This is not wisdom, but foolishness. It is indeed better to, to deny the self and to take up the cross, for in that sacrifice we will find prosperity of a life submitted to the Lord that is more powerful than the destructive and impoverished ways of the Lord. You see, it is of far greater worth and value for God's sons and daughters to first walk in victory, to be delivered, to walk in faith, to be led by the Spirit, to be at peace, to be at calm, and to be able to trust in the Lord for all things, than to merely be showered with riches. Matthew 6 verse 232 says, For the pagans run after all these things. Jesus is talking about worldly things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first seek the kingdom and his righteousness. My dear listener, true prosperity is to feel secure and safe and peaceful and certain in our purpose and direction, despite the storms that wage around us. And this only comes when we truly begin to seek the Lord and his righteousness above earthly wealth. When we seek to place him above all things, therefore, Make him Lord by abandoning idolatry while seeking his deliverance and pursuing holiness and faithfulness. Then we shall know prosperity. Jesus on numerous, numerous, numerous occasions in his teachings alluded to the little value that earthly riches hold. For the true value lies in a relationship with God. Again, it says in Matthew 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Paul writes in Colossians 2 to the believers, Verse 2, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Remember, again, that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge is hidden in Christ. This, again, is truly true prosperity, to be united in love and to know the Lord. Blessing and prosperity is therefore more than money. According to the Strong's Complete Concordance of the Bible, one Hebrew word for prosperity is shalom. Shalom means completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. It speaks of completeness, safety, and soundness. It therefore covers our relationship with God and with people. The word prosperity in Hebrew is also associated with Yeshua, which alludes to salvation and deliverance. So God's thoughts concerning your prosperity is more than just about money. It is his desire to bless and prosper you by delivering you from the pitfalls of the world, from the self and the devil. The Lord seeks to save us from our downfall and to make us of a new creation. He desires to give you his grace, his favor, peace and protection to walk in his glory. Favor refers to grace that leads to joy. Pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, and loveliness. Prosperity, in essence, carries the idea of favor. Therefore, God's covering, God's guidance, and God's wisdom to lead us on the right path, path right throughout life. So, prosperity is about walking in God's glory so that we may have rest and peace from our troubles and from the demons within ourselves. It is a peace that comes by knowing God is our deliverer, our protector, our provider, our advisor, our master, and our shepherd. David knew the Lord and he enjoyed God's prosperity. Therefore, God's salvation delivers peace, protection, and provision. And for this reason he wrote in Psalm 34 verse 19, The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, no, not one of them will be broken. 
Sadly, we are so often looking to God for prosperity in terms of wealth, instead of looking towards God for His prosperity in terms of being at peace and enjoying the blessing of deliverance, provision, protection, and favor. Indeed, we need His shalom, His completeness in spirit, soul, and body. We need His full measure of peace to operate in our lives. This is of far greater worth than earthly riches. This does not mean God does not intend to bless you with material things, but our priorities should be focused on God's heavenly prosperity, as Jesus taught in Matthew 6. God desires us to first to walk in His Spirit and truth before we seek any other earthly treasure. And this is so important for us to understand. Again, it is not about the tangible. It is about the spiritual. The prosperity of God that we should seek is therefore the prosperity that grants us life and life in abundance. For it enables and empowers us to walk in His divine strength, favor, goodwill, wisdom, faith, and love. Now listen to what the Lord says to Joshua regarding being prosperous and successful in Joshua chapter 1 verse 7. I'm reading from verse 7. The Lord says to him, be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse 8. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate it on a day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And it says, This book of law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, that thou shalt observe to do according to all that is written there within. So that is what it says in Joshua 7. Now Joshua chapter 1 from verse 7. So again, God writes here, and God says to Joshua, that if you obey me, that if you heal and submit to me, then I will make you prosperous. And it says in verse 9 as well, that if you do this, be strong and of good courage, that and be not dismayed, for the Lord like God is with thee. So, that is what it truly means to be prosperous. To obey, to submit. For then God will lead us in victory, in peace. In the, in, in the soundness, in the completeness of spirit, soul and body. We will enjoy God's peace, His provision and protection. We need to therefore obey the word of God wholeheartedly, not turn from it to the right or to the left, not compromise on the word of God and keep the word of God. This is what we need to do. We need to keep the word of God. And the word of God must always be on our lips. We can also go and read what it says in Psalm 1 about what it means to prosper and to be blessed. We need to memorize and immerse ourselves, therefore, with the word of God. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is the word that became flesh. So indeed, if we wish to remain prosperous, we need to abide in the Lord. According to John 15, obey his word, obey his teachings, follow his ways, and live to his glory. Joshua's life was one of prosperity. And so was the life of those who trusted and had faith in God, like David and Moses. The Lord also desires for us to walk in such glorious prosperity, where we take hold of God, who delivers us from all our afflictions, who saves us from the horrible pit, who calms the storms around us, and who saves us from ourselves. This world and the devil for a glorious life of abundant divine life. So you see, we need to turn our eyes away from the temporary to the eternal, away from the tangible and to the supernatural. My dear listener, prosperity is really about our relationship with God, living and abiding in the supernatural, in the true peace, the true life in the, under the blood of our Lord Jesus. For in the blood of Jesus is our victory, our deliverance, our healing, our salvation, our redemption. In Him is already the fulfilled provision, the fulfilled healing, but we need to abide in Him. 
for then we shall be prosperous, wealthy and rich in spirit and, and soul. Soul meaning that our emotions, our feelings, our will will be in alignment with God. We will enjoy His blessing, His, His favor, His presence. And no wealth on this earth can replace that. That is what true prosperity is all about. Again, it is what John wrote in 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I, beloved, I wish that about all things that you may prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. We must allow God to have complete dominion over us in body, soul and spirit. Which, for then we shall truly prosper and be in good health by the abundant resurrected life of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to play for you a clip here from Paul Washer about uh, what the true prosperity gospel as well is about. Everyone who thirsts come to the water and who have no money Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine, milk, without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. What's going on here? What's going on here is this. He is speaking to a vile and wicked nation. He is speaking to a nation whose idolatry and perversion and harlotry is so great that they have been cast out of the promised land and they have been severely punished and disciplined, carried off into exile, left there without any hope whatsoever. But a few promises. And we see all throughout the book of Isaiah, rebuke after rebuke after rebuke. God's justice screaming out against a wicked people. But then we come to those chapters towards the end of the 40s and into the early 50s. The Messiah, the Redeemer, appears. And He appears and does a work of salvation that no man can grasp or comprehend. One of the greatest and most fearful and sad things about being a preacher is you know from the moment that you take upon yourself to preach the cross and preach what God has done through His Son Jesus Christ, you are going to fail. And so you have this people cast down and rightfully so, judged and rightfully so, every promise it seems taken away from them, and then all of a sudden appears on the scene the Messiah. And that Messiah goes to a tree. And on that tree He bears the sins of His people. And He's crushed under the full force of His Father's wrath. And He satisfies justice with His death. And He makes it possible for a just God to forgive a wicked people. Now after this work of the Messiah, when we get to chapter 54, we see great and almost unspeakable blessings that would flow from His death. His life, His resurrection, all that God would accomplish through it. And then after laying out for the people all these great blessings that would come to them in Christ, He gives them an invitation. He says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. Everyone. Don't you ever confuse the issue here. The invitation of God is wide and it is deep. Everyone who hears this proclamation, and we can see in the context that it is not merely limited to Israel. Everyone who thirsts, let him come. Let him come to me, he says. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. We see a group of people who are absolutely destitute of virtue and merit. They have nothing in their hands to barter with God. They can pay for nothing. But he says, come, you have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. One of the things that you have to understand today is I think in some ways the charismatic movement is twisted and torn and heretical in many ways that it is. Sometimes it almost seems as though it's a rebuke to us. Yeah, they talk about their prosperity and they talk about their blessing and they talk about all these things and they've taken those words and twisted them, but I'm afraid we don't use them at all. He says, come to Me. And what does He promise them? Just merely water? No, He goes on to describe it. Come buy from Me wine and milk, the choicest of the land. 
You see, what we've got to understand is that there is a prosperity in coming to God. It is not necessarily a prosperity of health. I'm broken into a million pieces. I have more metal in me than a Tonka truck. It is not necessarily a prosperity of health or wealth or wisdom, but it is a prosperity of drinking from Him, of feeding from Him, of knowing Him. That a man could be so defiled, laid upon a dung heap, condemned to die, and then through the blood of a Savior, be raised up to walk not only in fellowship, not only in communion, but in the sphere of sonship. I rail at these preachers today who promise more than the Bible promises to get men to come to Christ. Come to Christ. And God will fix this. Come to Christ and God will fix that. Do not cheapen the Gospel call. Come to Christ because of Christ. Come to Christ to feed upon Him. Come to Christ to live with Him. Heaven is not heaven because of streets of gold and gates of pearl. Heaven is heaven because of the presence of God manifest in His Son. And we need to be sure that when we are giving a gospel invitation, that we come with the full force of God's blessing. There is a joy and a life and a glory to be had. A few years ago, I read an article from a very well established reform magazine that was talking about Harry Potter. And um, all of you automatically think, you know, let's have an inquisition and come against Harry Potter. But in a way, I want you to know that Harry Potter is a rebuke also to the church. When, when a child reads Harry Potter, they see wonder and wildness and life and magic and struggle and victory and defeat and everything that we're made up to be. Now when they see your Christianity, all they see is a pew and a cold sermon. did not come to give us merely correct thinking. He came to give us life and life in abundance. And you can experience that life even if your body is screaming with pain. To feed upon Christ. Christ! I love the warning that Spurgeon gives when he talks about everything being in Christ. The prosperity and the blessing upon blessing upon blessing of knowing Christ. And that He warns all of His young theologians. And He says, some of you think it's all in truth. Think everything in Christianity is it's all wrapped up in doctrine and knowing this doctrine and that doctrine. Well, doctrine is extremely important and truth is the foundation of everything we have with God. But you must understand that truth is not the end. It is the means to an end of drinking the wine and the milk of a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. The wedding in Cana proved that to us because Jesus took the water of religion and turned it into the wine of everlasting life. You cannot come to this passage without thinking that you ought to run or that you ought to chance jump or you ought to dance with all your might. Because he's looking at a bunch of beggars who are condemned to die, who are starving and rightfully so, who cannot lift their head to give one argument against their condemnation. And he says to them, based on what my Messiah has done, now come. Any one of you who is thirsty, come. There's so many of you who are truly Christian but you're thirsty. You're hungry. You sometimes ask yourself, is this all it is? Is this it? Well, I want you to know it's not some wild, charismatic experience that's going to lift you out of your doldrums into a new life. But it is coming to Christ. And basically coming to Christ in His Word. But not just to gather information, to find out who He is. Holy, dear 
design This place in time That I might seek and find my God My God Oh feel so strongly about the uh, so-called prosperity gospel? Uh, there's an easy answer, but before I give it, um, let me define it a little bit. Um, it's, it's on a continuum from the most radical to what would be called soft or light. And uh, the most radical would be basically say, God wants you rich. And you should partner with him by faith to pursue riches. And the justification would be given, can't accomplish much in life without money. And so, go for it. Or another rationale might be, you're kingdom kids, and kingdom kids don't wear tattered clothes, they dress like the king, and so on. The light would be simply being more cautious not to say those gross things about wealth, but to minimize sin 
and minimize pain and only talk about how well things will go for you if you follow Christ. So why, why do I abominate this so-called gospel? I think it is another gospel. And uh, the first reason would be simply to go straight to the Bible and see what Paul says about those who want to be rich. I mean, it's just... He says, this is 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Now there's great gain in godliness with contentment, in other words, without craving for stuff. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. <laughs> it's just amazing. But those who desire to be rich, now here's the key text, this is verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, that is, this craving to be rich, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In other words, the, the very thing that leads people to suicidal piercings of pangs, namely the desire to be rich, is nurtured and cultivated by the prosperity preachers. They are encouraging that this suicidal behavior happen. That's abominable. Or Jesus, Jesus said, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that? It's because riches are such dangerous things. They're not a blessing usually. They're usually a curse. People are cursed with riches. They're destroyed by riches. And here again, a little parenthesis of qualification. I don't mean it's sinful to make a lot of money. I just mean it's sinful to want to keep a lot of money. And it's suicidal to want to keep a lot of money. Bigger barns and bigger cars and bigger houses and bigger portfolios and finer clothes and everything is growing with your income so that your, your conscience is getting harder and harder because if you're a Christian at this point, your conscience is having to say, it's okay, it's okay, this is, this is okay, this is the Calvary road, this is what it means to deny yourself, this is what it means to follow Jesus, this is what it means to die every day, this is what it means to have my treasure in heaven, and it doesn't, it won't work. So your conscience has to be lacerated in order to keep from killing yourself. And so Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. Paul says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and pierce themselves with many pangs. And along comes a prosperity preacher who says, yes, the Lord really wants you to be rich. We should pursue riches. Following Jesus is the pathway to riches. Riches are the sign of God's blessing. I would just say those are in mutual contradiction for each other and therefore this is deadly. Now, here's another reason I'm, I'm really upset about this. These prosperity preachers, preachers don't just talk to Americans who are already fairly well off and try to help them you know, become a little more rich. They get on their jets, their personal jets, and they fly to Africa or the Philippines. And they land and they gather a stadium full of 100,000 desperately poor people and tell them if they'll believe in Jesus, they'll get rich and all their needs will be met and their wives don't have miscarriages anymore, blah, blah, blah. Then they get in their jet with their pockets full and go home. That's wicked. Because the Bible is so filled with teachings that in this life, this is a momentary affliction here. This light momentary affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What's Paul referring to there? He's referring to a lifetime. Light and momentary corresponds to the weight of eternal glory in heaven. He means when you come to Christ, you come and die, 
and you can count on it through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven normal Christianity is pain sorrowful yet always rejoicing is the pattern prosperity preachers do not prepare new converts in third world countries to endure the realities of what it will cost them to be a Christian is another reason there are 1,568 or so, as we talk, people groups in the world out of 13,000 that don't even have missionaries engaging them, and therefore everybody in them is without hope. Most of those 1,500 people groups are in very dangerous places, meaning if you go there, your kids might either get disease and die, or uh, your wife might be captured and raped, or your family might be butchered and killed who's going to go we have to go Jesus said make disciples of every people group not just the easy ones not just the comfortable ones who's going to go the product of prosperity preachers I don't think so the people that are going to go are the people that have been taught that to to follow Christ is to suffer and it's brief it's only 80 years and then comes heaven. I just read this morning with Noel and Talitha, uh, first paragraphs of uh, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down like a bride prepared for her husband. And he will dwell with us, and we will be his people, and he will be our God. And then every tear will be wiped away and every uh, pain will be gone for the former things. The former things have passed away. That's common. The, the, the essential biblical problem, maybe that's an overstatement, one of the essential biblical problems with the prosperity gospel is an over-realized eschatology. Meaning, the things that are promised gloriously for us. We're all going to be rich. We're going to own the world. We're going to judge angels. Paul used that argument in 1 Corinthians 3. Don't you realize that you are going to inherit the world? The world is yours. Paulus is yours. Cephas is yours. Life is yours. Death is yours. And the conclusion he, he drew was, why would you boast in men? In other words, why wouldn't you take that as a means of enabling you to suffer and be lowly and kind and servant-like and walk on this Calvary road and take the pain of being a Christian? That's coming. But what they do, instead of say, uh, we have to wait for that and, and pour our lives out through many tribulations here, they say, bring it now. Bring it now. The kingdom's already here, right? Je Jesus brought the kingdom. And it's the overlap of these two ages they don't understand. The, the, the new age is a beautiful age. And there are healings that happen in this world. I don't deny that. I just deny very vehemently everybody's going to be healed. You let these prosperity preachers with their healing talk and their word of faith talk go to the fourth floor of Augustana home or go to the emergency rooms or to the uh, intensive care rooms of hospitals. Go there. Go there and preach your gospel. No, they don't. They wear their nice clothes, stand up with the lights, money strewn all over the, the thing with people out here who desperately want somebody to tell them how to get rich, and there they make a lot of money that way. They don't go to the places where it's impossible to deal with reality unless you've got a theology of suffering. And so for all those reasons and more, it's a tragic thing that one of our greatest exports of America is the prosperity gospel. People are being destroyed by it. Christians are being weakened by it. God is being dishonored by it. And souls are perishing because of it. And a lot of guys are getting rich on it. Mm -hmm.